Hello, and thank you for rejoining for our second session of this afternoon. We know that when debt levels are too high, it stifles investment and may sow the seeds for future crises. Yet corporations, many short on cash during lockdowns, had little choice but to load up on debt during the pandemic. Economies are now reopening and some of the crisis support put in place by governments is slowly being removed. As we return to something approaching normal, how worried should we be about the macroeconomic implications of a debt overhang? Professor Moritz Schullerich of the University of Bonn has assessed this question and is now going to tell us what he found out. I'll hand over now to the session chair, ECB executive board member, Fabio Panetta. Mr. Panetta, over to you. Thank you, Claire, and good afternoon to everybody. It is a pleasure to chair this session and introduce the paper by Professor Moritz Schullerig from the University of Bonn. The paper brings together two topics that are widely debated in the current environment, uh, uh, corporate indebtedness and macroeconomic stabilization. I'm sure that Morris will explain very clearly the findings of the paper, which answers the question of whether corporate indebtedness creates key risks for a quick economic rebound. But let me spoiler this for you. The answer of the paper is no. Corporate indebtedness is unlikely to weigh heavily on the recovery. This doesn't mean, however, that corporate indebtedness does not matter for policymaking during the recovery. I will take a couple of minutes to give you an example of why it does matter. In the initial phase of the pandemic, the choices facing policymakers were relatively narrow. Both monetary and fiscal policy had to support the economy on a massive scale. The su this support has sheltered firms from liquidity crisis, but at the same time, it has significantly increased leverage. In 2020, the corporate debt to GDP ratio rose by eight percentage points. Such headline increase, in turn, has exacerbated a key feature of the euro area economy, one that policymakers will have to take into account in the recovery phase. I am referring to heterogeneity. Firms' financial conditions have become more heterogeneous across countries, as the paper shows very clearly. Heterogeneity has risen also within countries, across firms and sectors of activity. Leverage has increased especially for those firms that had weak financial conditions already before the crisis. Another source of heterogeneity is the financial instrument used by corporates. During the crisis, most firms turned to their banks to cover their liquidity needs, but an increasing number of companies started issuing bonds on public markets. Taking into account these heterogeneities is crucial for central banks. We know that firms with different leverage and financial structures respond differently to monetary policy impulses. Heterogeneity also matters for other policymakers. I'm thinking, for instance, about the need to reform insolvency regimes in a post-COVID world in order to identify and resolve non-viable debt while facilitating the restructuring of viable debt. This distinction between viable and non-viable debt is crucial when financial conditions are highly heterogeneous. So, although the conclusions of the paper are relatively benign, the subject of the paper is extremely relevant for policy reasons. But let me stop here and hand over to Moritz, who will have 20 minutes for his presentation. Well, thank you very much, uh, Fabio, despite the spoiler. Uh, it's a great honor to, uh, and pleasure to uh, speak here to you today. Thank you for the organizers for the opportunity to present uh, my work. I want to talk about corporate debt, its role in driving macroeconomic fluctuations and the implications for policy, as you said. I will take a macro perspective and a long run perspective. Uh, I want to turn back, if you will, in order to look ahead. Uh, and that's very much the idea of this paper, namely to aggregate our knowledge about corporate debt 
dynamics over the business cycle. Let me start with uh, what you also mentioned at the beginning, at the introduction, Fabio, is the pandemic hit economies after a decade-long corporate debt boom, and debt to GDP has risen very sharply in the recession as well. The questions I want to address today, uh, what does this mean for the economic outlook? Especially, will corporate debt overhang restrain investment? Will roaming zombie firms, we heard, uh, heard about them from Victoria, will they slow down the recovery? And as you mentioned, there is a sense of history repeating in the air. Um, household debt overhang slowed down spending post-2008, and the experience of Japan in the 1990s where corporate debt overhang and zombification contributed to a very slow and, and, and drawn-out recovery from the crisis. Is, we're well aware of that as well. So what I'm going to do in this paper is I want to study corporate debt and output dynamics across the near universe of modern business cycles. So it is a big picture view based on novel long run data for corporate debt in 18 advanced economies since 1870. The data cover loans, bonds and lending for non-bank intermediaries to the entire corporate sector. And for further details, um, I recommend you have a look at the paper with uh, Oscar Martin and Alan that this work is uh, also based on and will have these data uh, available at the, the JST database, uh, macrohistory.net. So with this, um, with this introduction, let's take a look at the bigger picture. Let's look at, uh, take a bird's eye view of corporate debt over GDP ratios in the long term. And they are marked by financial deepening in the, uh, in the early industrialization, a collapse in the Great Depression and World War II, and a slow and steady increase ascend after World War II. Um, and you also see on the uh, right-hand side quite an acceleration in, in, recent, in the recent uh, period and a jump about 10 percentage points, 15 percentage points in the last couple of years alone. We can also see is there is quite some cyclical variation in, in corporate debt, although this is a median across these countries. And it is that cyclical variation in the data that I want the, the booms, the corporate credit booms, the surges, if you will, that I want to study explicitly in this, in this paper. Um, another way to look at the data is to divide um, corporate debt to GDP changes in, in five-year five periods and plot their distribution. And this is what I do here in this chart, which shows the uh, distribution of all five-year changes in corporate debt over GDP in these 18 economies. And you also see vertical lines that mark the position or the distributional position of um, a number of important economies, France, Germany, Italy, Spain, and the US, and where the, the last five-year credit, corporate credit boom fits into the distribution. As Fabio said, I think there are two main messages here from this chart. One is that for some countries, for especially for the US and France, indeed the last five years have been quite a, quite a um, large credit boom, have seen um, that is uh, on the right, sort of right of the distribution. On the other hand, and that's the advantage of these long run data that we can use, it's clearly not um, out of proportion. We have quite a few other observations uh, if you look at the density of, of the distribution here. Other countries, if you look at Germany, if you look at Italy, if you look at Spain, um, for those countries, the past five years, even included the COVID related increase and corporate debt um, have not been have not witnessed particularly large increases in corporate debt over GDP. The idea of large heterogeneity is also confirmed. We zoom in on the in the past decade, on the decade since the global financial crisis, uh, for seven economies here. Uh, you see, there's three economies that uh, we will talk in greater detail, I guess, in the following and and also after this conference, which are uh, the U.S., France, and China, where corporate the corporate debt increase in the past decade has been particularly pronounced. There's a group of European economies plus Japan and 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 um, including the UK here, that um, basically have corporate debt to GDP levels uh, at the very same uh, level as they were in uh, at the at the end of the uh, global financial crisis. Okay, so in the next 
step, I want to look at uh, corporate debt dynamics over the business cycle. And I call this a big data approach because uh, we have uh, data for almost all business cycles in these 18 advanced economies. So we can say something about how, bis how corporate debt shapes uh, business cycle dynamics. The first chart, uh, the first two charts, give you give you the main um, idea of the paper. Uh, namely, on the left hand side, we uh, show how changes in corporate debt, um, how corporate debt buildups in over five year periods uh, are related or correlated with real GDP outcomes in the following uh, in the following three year period. Another way of putting this is we ask the question whether corporate debt changes, corporate uh, lagged corporate debt surges and booms predict future GDP outcomes. And on the left hand side, you can see this for, as I mentioned, the near universe of business cycles and advanced economies, there is basically no no correlation in the data. Corporate debt does not predict uh, GDP outcomes. If you look at the right-hand side chart, however, uh, where we uh, repeat the same exercise with household debt, you see a clear negative correlation, uh, which uh, meshes nicely for, with recent work by uh, Ativ Mian and, and Amir Sufi and Emil Werner, who also point to the predictive power of household uh, debt booms uh, for negative GDP outcomes ahead. In the following, I will look at this core results and um, become a little bit more formal. So we're going to estimate uh, local projections that show us how, that gives an idea how dynamically corporate debt buildups shape the recession severity and the recovery speed across this large uh, picture, large um, set of uh, business cycles in the modern era. So we're starting with a very simple chart that shows you how the normal a normal business cycle uh, looks from a long-term historical perspective. We start in year zero at the peak of the cycle. In year one of the recession, we lose one or two percent of GDP, real GDP. By year two and three, we're back to the previous peak level of output, and then we continue to grow along. In the following chart, I will, uh, we will sh I'll show you the estimates of how a large household debt boom in the preceding expansion period shapes or alters, affects this average path of economies going through a business cycle. It looks like this. The red line here uh, with, um, with uh, a relatively tightly estimated 95% confidence intervals shows you how two standard deviation household credit to GDP increase in the previous business cycle, in the previous expansion phase, slows down um, first of all, increases the severity of the recession and then slows down the recovery so that between the, the post-household credit boom GDP path and the normal GDP path, a quite a large gap opens up after four and five years. We're talking easily here about four or five uh, percent of GDP, an experience that I think many of you in the room um, have also noticed after the global financial crisis where um, sort of persistently our forecasts for the recovery speed were too optimistic. So now in the next step, I'm going to look at the same chart, uh, but um, uh, not look at household credit uh, booms in the preceding expansion, but at the effect that business or corporate credit uh, surges have on the recession path. And the picture looks like this. The blue line is the two standard deviation increase in the corporate debt to GDP ratio in the preceding five year period. And essentially the path is the average path of the economy going through, of economies going through the uh, business cycle is hardly affected. The blue line is, is, is virtually on, on top of the, the black dash line. Um, so there's a large difference here between household and business credit groups. Um, that, but that this key result um, um, is uh, going to be conditional is that business uh, corporate credit booms do not shape business cycle dynamics and that corporate debt booms do not typically um, leave large traces on output dynamics um, is going to be conditional, however, on three main caveats. And I'm going to go through these three caveats um, um, now one at a time. The first caveat is that the sectoral composition of the corporate debt boom matters. Um, we uh, owe this insight to recent research by 
um, Carsten Miller and Emil Werner, who showed that tradable sector corporate debt booms do leave um, traces, do predict bad real economic outcomes. This is reproducing um, the charts from their work here for a large sample of 116 emerging and advanced economies. So it's a slightly different sample, and this is really taken from their work. Um, but you see the difference between uh, the outcomes of or the, the aftermath of tradable, non-tradable um, corporate debt booms and tradable corporate debt booms. The idea being that the non-tradable debt booms resemble very much um, the household debt booms. They're typically related to uh, real estate boom and bust cycles, whereas tradable sector booms um, enhance productive capaci capacity and have um, a positive growth outcomes uh, down the road. Um, with this recent research in mind, we can look at the composition of the corporate debt boom, the sectoral composition of the corporate debt boom in the past decade. And my reading of these um, of these two charts, on the left-hand side, again, the non-tradable sectors, um, this is indexed to uh, 2015 is, is 100. So you can see the economies coming in and going out of the 2015 level of non-tradable and tradable corporate debt to GDP. My reading of these two charts is that uh, the boom in the past decade was not particularly tilted towards non-tradable sectors. We have not seen a classical uh, real estate uh, credit fuel boom bust cycle, also not in the two economies that continuously stand out here as having had particularly pronounced corporate debt uh, dynamics, namely the US and France. Um, in, even in, also in these two economies, the dominant part of uh, the uh, debt increase happened in, in tradable sectors and can be expected to have um, more benign economic outcomes. They also happen, this is a dimension I talk about in the paper, uh, the non-tradable debt booms also happen um, to be less um, that's concentrated in asset-based lending, and more concentrated in asset-based lending. So the uh, the feedback mechanism between declining in asset prices and declines in net wealth are much more pronounced, whereas tradable sector lending tends to be cash flow-based and hence not, um, not prone to these dynamics. The second caveat is that, and we heard this from Victoria earlier, is that debt reorganization frictions matter. Um, what this um, graph here uh, suggests is that business credit booms become painful or have leave traces on the business cycle and have this negative aftermath if and when they occur in economies where debt reorganization, insolvency and bankruptcy frictions are high. So when it's costly and inefficient and takes a long time to resolve um, corporate uh, over indebtedness and insolvencies, uh, the real economic effects of corporate debt booms show up. You see this here in this, uh, in this lower line, the purple line, where we trace the effects of or the aftermath of business credit to GDP to standard deviation increases in high friction insolvency regimes. Um, again, in the, in the low friction, corporate debt booms basically blow over in, the, in these high friction regimes, uh, output costs reappear. So now what we can do is we can use these uh, coefficient estimates coming from the long run sample and apply them to the current context. We can say, we can trace how relative to the baseline trajectory going forward from 2021 to 2024, the combination of a corporate credit boom and uh, bankruptcy frictions, which uh, by the way are taken from the junk of heart McLeish and Schleifer paper and then updated in recent years, um, how these frictions combined with a corporate credit boom uh, can be expected to affect the economic outlook going forward. And uh, the result for looking at Germany, US and Italy is um, there's very much, very little uh, we have to be worried about. Uh, in the case of Italy, the coefficient is even positive, which has to do with the fact that uh, corporate debt in Italy uh, was actually reduced in the US and Germany. There's very little deviation. The one country to watch possibly is France. These indicators are imperfect and they measure institutional quality only with a very large um, a noisy background, but uh, according to these indicators, France would be a country where um, the GDP outlook could be a little bit um, um, 
negatively affected. We come to my last caveat for this overall benign view of the aftermath of corporate debt booms and corporate debt surges. It is uh, banking supervision and the zombie problem. I'm showing here data from a recent paper by Ryan Banerjee and Boris Hoffman from the BAS, uh, who define zombie companies, these are publicly listed companies, uh, zombie firms as companies who have insufficient earnings to cover the interest rate expenses and have a low stock market valuation. And the point here is to show that uh, the evidence is actually quite mixed. There are some countries, if you look at the UK and the US, where zombie shares seem to have increased quite substantially in recent years. If you look closer, the increase happens to be in the mining and energy sectors. But then there are a few countries as well where zombie shares in Germany, for example, uh, trend downwards or don't do much. Um, so the third caveat will be what is, um, and the zombie phenomenon obviously is very closely linked to um, evergreening of loans by banks and incentives for banks, as well as weak insolvency regimes, as we heard in the first paper, um, to uh, avoid loss realization and 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 reorganize the balance sheets. So what we can do is we can also ask, is there evidence in the long run data that in, in regimes where banking supervision is weak, the aftermath of corporate credit booms becomes more costly. And once more, if you look at the left hand side, the purple line, uh, there is some evidence. Uh, it's not statistically highly significant. Some evidence that after a business a corporate credit boom, um, in a poor supervision environment, the GDP outcomes are subpar, are worse than average. And there's also some evidence that this goes hand in hand with an increase in the zombie share as measured by uh, Banerjee and Hoffman in their paper, potentially suggesting that there is a link from uh, the emergence of zombies, the um, inefficient allocation of capital and uh, productivity um, a lacking productivity growth to the real macro outcomes that are plotted on the left hand side. So uh, let me let me sum up and talk uh, use my last uh, two and a half minutes to talk a little bit about uh, the implications of what I've just shown you as, as I see them. Um, first of all, the long run view summary is indeed that the aftermath of sharp increases in corporate credit is typically benign. Um, since this is a borderline Panglossian view, uh, let me um, also come back to the three caveats, but overall conclude that none of these three caveats currently raises big red flags. Um, first, in advanced economies, the sectoral composition of the post global financial crisis corporate credit boom was not tilted towards non-tradable credit. We have not seen the boom bust real estate dynamics that we've seen, for example, in Japan. Again, we've also um, talked about the uh, caveat that debt reorganization frictions might lead to larger output costs than, than the average path that I, uh, that I showed you. Um, and it's, it's true, and we've, we've heard this um, earlier, that weaknesses in debt reorganization regimes persist, and Europe has some way to do that, to go there, to uh, reach a truly federal um, um, regime. But an important point is that the countries that um, don't score that well on this indicator that have, you know, that are, uh, it's, we call like often named as countries that have somewhat uh, sluggish, inefficient, and, um, um, and, and uh, a slow uh, debt reorganization, insolvency, liquidation regimes are not the ones that boomed in the past decade. So Italy, Spain come to mind where um, corporate debt was actually. Um, decreasing. Um, the main worry that I continue to have is bank supervision. Uh, it's definitely much improved, and we're not, um, you know, we're not in sort of 19, 1990s Japan scenario. But zombie lending is undead in Europe, as recent papers have shown, and uh, I think that's a, a part to keep in mind. And of these three caveats, the one that, in my view, would be the one to worry most about loss realization and balance sheet strength are very important. We've learned this from the sluggish cleanup after the GFC. What are the implications of this? Well, the fears of a post-pandemic headwind to growth caused by corporate debt are likely unfounded. Efficient reorganization liquidations framework are crucial. I can just underline what we heard earlier. Um, in terms of corporate zombies, um, the evidence is, is mixed, uh, but supervision and loss realization is crucial. And the last point is 
that is important to me that this debate about monetary policy and zombies is not only about zombies. A very nice recent research has shown that aggregate demand conditions are paramount for the success of new firms, of startups and firm formation. So to the degree that monetary policy creates the conditions for, uh, for stable and, and, and strong aggregate demand, it effectively helps to create the business environment, the environment in which new businesses can thrive. And that's very much the opposite of the zombie fears that are often raised. Thank you very much. I uh, close here. Thank you, Moritz, for this very clear presentation. I'm sure that your findings will spur an interesting debate. To kickstart this debate, we will have a 10 minutes uh, discussion by Egon uh, uh, Zakrashek from the Bank for International Settlements. While Egon prepares his presentation, uh, let me remind uh, participants that wish to ask uh, uh, questions at the end of uh, Egon's presentation, they should get ready to raise their virtual hand. And please do not be shy. Uh, with this, Egon, the floor is yours. Okay, uh, sorry about that. Um, <clears throat> so thank you, Fabio, for uh, for invitation and to the organizers for inviting me to discuss this uh, very, very interesting paper. Um, as, as was pointed out, in the years leading to the COVID pandemic, uh, corporate debt levels in advanced economies have risen substantially. Um, and uh, not surprisingly, the, the nature of the COVID-19 shock has led to a further significant increase in corporate debt. Um, just to put some context around there, uh, the panel to the left, the red box and whisker spot shows the distribution of the 2019-20 change in credit to non-financial corporates normalized by the 2019 GDP. You can see for the median advanced economy in this sample, when that increase was 10 percentage points. There's a lot of heterogeneity with some countries uh, registering very significant increases. By way of comparison, uh, the corresponding median increase in the credit um, to household sector was a lot more muted, around six percentage point, and it's also coming from lower levels reflecting kind of post-GFC uh, household sector deleveraging. Um, the panel to the right looks at this a slightly different and asks, you know, which countries borrowed most during the pandemic? So it just shows on the x-axis the 2019 credit to GDP ratios for both sectors against the corresponding change between 2019 and 20. Okay, and as you can see, there's a clearly a positive uh, relationship. So saying that countries that came into the pandemic with high levels of debt on average borrowed significantly more. In particularly, um, there's a countries up in the upper right corner, Belgium, France, and Sweden that registered very, very sizable increases, uh, pandemic-related increases in corporate debt, and those are coming on the top of already very high levels leading into the pandemic. So what this session is about and what Morris, Morris's paper is really about is how concerned should you as policymakers be about these recent developments? Um, as we heard, according to Moritz, not too much. And why is that? Um, so the, the real, uh, the, 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 the answer to that comes from 150 years of macro financial history for 18 advanced economies. And um, what the you know, striking finding, finding that emerges from, from this research is that, that unlike household debt booms, corporate debt booms do not influence post peak GDP dynamics. In other words, corporate debt booms are not systematically followed by deeper recessions or weaker and more sluggish recoveries. Uh, that's a very striking and a, and a new finding. There are, however, important caveats, and Morris uh, discussed that, so I'm just briefly summarize that. The first one is that composition of corporate debt matters, right? So if you have, if the corporate debt buildup is very concentrated in non-tradable goods sector, that should be worrisome. Uh, those things, those kind of corporate booms look a lot more like household credit booms. Um, the other thing that matters, and we heard it also in Victoria's presentation and in an earlier discussion, is that insolvency regimes must be efficient, which makes sense because the, it's the restructuring of the firm's balance sheets 
that's going to get you uh, out and allow uh, investment and output to recover after a shock. Uh, the other point that's also discussed in the paper is, is that bank-centric, as opposed to market-based financial systems, also tend to be more vulnerable uh, to, uh, to corporate credit booms. And this point has been made before in, in, in by Alan Greenspan, the so-called spare tire argument, and there was some interesting research by my colleagues uh, at the BIS that has looked at those things. And, you know, those things are kind of a tied to banking supervision in the sense that, you know, um, a weak supervision allows banks to kind of employ extend and pretend policies that can lead to zombie lending, which then have deleterious effects on economic dynamics. Um, I think this is a very interesting, it's a thought-provoking and a timely paper, obviously. And I do want to call out that, you know, the construction of this credit series that uh, Moritz and his, uh, has, and Moritz and his co-authors have done is a really, really important contribution to the macro history database. It's a great public good. Uh, so Moritz, thank you for doing that. Um, I will have two comments. Uh, the first comment is best summarized by a quote by Mark Twain who said, um, history never repeats itself, but it often rhymes. And the question is, how well does current situation rhyme with past history? And then my second comment will be a little broader, is, is, is that I will argue that fluctuations in aggregate credit quantities, those are the kind of things that Moritz and his co-authors are looking at, provide an incomplete account of credit cycles. And I'll be more specific when I get to, 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 that, to that slide. So, you know, to give you just kind of my bottom line, what is my view is, is that I am somewhat less sanguine than Moritz, and I think that the current corporate debt buildup presents a downside tail risks to the economic outlook. So, um, how informative can history be about the COVID-19 uh, fallout? Um, I would argue that maybe not too much, um, and one of the reasons is that the COVID-19 shock is complete, very, very unprecedented, right? It has a very strong supply side dimension, reflecting all the economic and social restrictions imposed by the authorities uh, that, you know, they were uh, to deal with uh, to deal with this uh, health crisis, public health crisis. On top of that, monetary and fiscal responses were coordinated. They were unprecedented. They're still ongoing. And importantly, the support programs uh, that were enacted in different countries, differed across countries, but in general, they were of very broad scope and limited conditionality. So I think this just kind of really complicates, you know, how to think about this buildup and, you know, how we're going to get out of that uh, or, you know, for the near-term business cycle dynamics. And I think, and this this point was echoed by, by Fabio in his introductory remarks, is that I think a much, you know, an approach, while history is certainly, you know, I'm a big fan of this kind of approach, but I think for this, looking at with firm level heterogeneity, looking by industry, size, financial conditions would be really, really important. Now, what's interesting is, is there has been some very interesting work done, and it's a very important, I think, French case study. And France is particularly interested, because if you remember from my first graph, right, it's a country that exhibited a big pandemic-induced buildup in corporate debt, and it entered the crisis with a with a high level of corporate debt to GDP. So in March 2020, the French Parliament established a committee, it was chaired by Benoit Coré, who is your former colleague, is now a colleague of mine at the BIS, and they looked uh, to evaluate and monitor, you know, the financial support available to French companies during the crisis. And what's I think really great about these studies is is that. Um, uh, his team combined firm level information on the take up of credit support scheme and it matched that with their corresponding firm level balance, income and balance sheet data. So very large comprehensive database, 3.5 million French firms, uh, and they're analyzing what happened you know, to these things during the first two waves of a pandemic. There are a lot of interesting results. I sort of pulled out, I think, three points that I think are very germane to today's discussion. So the first one is, is that the intensity take-up rate, so the, the amount of support a firm received relative to its turnover, was highest for financially weakest firms. So that's not great news, right? So that means is that the pandemic-induced buildup was very much concentrated in a part of the firm distribution that was already financially weak. Um, the second point is, is that the share of the, the money that was paid out to small businesses was higher than their share of employment. 
Okay, so it means that, that you know um, the, the the credit schemes were you know the amount dispersed went very disproportionately to small businesses, which could very well make sense since they were in industries or sectors that were most hit by the pandemic. But it also brings up a point that was discussed earlier that you have a lot of small businesses. If there is an avalanche, a cascade, uh, a highly correlated set of defaults, this could potentially overwhelm uh, the court systems um, and you know impede an efficient resolution of these things, and that could slow down the recovery. Now, on the good news is, is that um, pre-crisis zombies, so defined in a traditional way, uh, did not make a disproportionate use of the credit support scheme. So that's on a good news. But, you know, I think as, you know, Victoria's research showed, and there's other stuff uh, that has been looking into this stuff, defining zombies is not completely trivial. And, you know, the way you define it can give you very, very different uh, results. But at least, you know, in, in this case, I would say this is, this is uh, a little bit of a silver lining. Um, in my view, a lot more similar analysis using firm level data across different countries is needed to, to, to ascertain the likely impact of this corporate debt buildup on post-COVID macroeconomic dynamics. So history can teach us something, but I think I would be much more comfortable if we had many more French case studies done. Uh, my last comment uh, pertains to what I would call an integrated view of credit cycles. Um, the post-GFC research uh, on credit cycle of which Schulerich was uh, Moritz and his co-authors were instrumental uh, to kicking off, you know, convincingly demonstrates that at low frequencies, so three to five years, rapid sustained credit builds up, you know, predicts economic downturns. Uh, a point that is less appreciated, maybe not quite well, you know, known, is, is that investors' sentiment in credit markets also carries negative information about future economic growth above and beyond that contained in credit aggregates, okay? So what do we mean by credit market sentiment? So what, what this literature refers to, it refers to variation over time in expected returns to bearing credit risk. So when we say that the expected returns to bearing credit risks are too low, that's equivalent to saying that credit is priced too aggressively. That's manifested through narrow credit spread, lots of high yield bond issuance and easy laying standards. So it's not just the quantity, but it's also the pricing. Now, what's particularly interesting, and there's a lot of interesting theoretical work and empirical work done on this, is, is that exposed investors are predictably disappointed. In other words, this credit market sentiment is mean reverting, okay? So credit is priced too aggressively, it will mean revert. And that tends to lead to abrupt and large revaluation of credit related assets. It leads to supply in, in a pullback in the supply of credit and the downturn, right? So by just focusing on credit quantities, this part of the credit cycle is missing. I do think that that's important. Uh, I don't have historical data, but I did a little very simple exercise um, just to finish up, is I looked at the US. In the US, um, we have a measure, a reasonable measure of credit market sentiment over the last 50 years something called the excess bond premium. And the way you want to think of this is it's a corporate bond credit spread net of default risk. So being net of default risk has a natural interpretation as a measure of credit market sentiment. So what I have done here, the panels to the right, just show what happens if you have a standard, if you have a sustained corporate credit boom, that's in red, okay? That tends to be followed, okay, predictably by a reversal in credit market sentiment, okay, over the you know, near-term horizon. There's less so for the uh, household credit booms, but this is only U.S. data where, you know, you don't have very many household credit booms uh, over the last 40, 50 years. So another risk that I think policymakers should particularly be attuned to is, is that a sharp and sudden reversal in sentiment for these highly leveraged economies could be problematic. And there's very nice recent work by Arvind Krishnamurti and Tyler Muir, who looks at this dynamic in this interactive way, employing long history data and finds important nonlinear interaction effects. Thank you. Thank you, Egon, for this thought-provoking discussion. Before opening the floor for the Q&A session, let me remind the House rules. First, participants wishing to comment or ask questions should raise their virtual hand. Second, participants should limit their intervention to 90 seconds maximum to allow for an active discussion. 
Okay, we already have four uh, persons from the audience who have asked the floor. The first one in my list is uh, Governor Francois Viroa de Gallo from the Banque de France. Francois, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Fabio. I hope you can hear me. Very well. Okay. Uh, and thank you to Moritz. Uh, so, in 90 seconds, one remark, one strong interest, and one question. The remark is about methodology. Uh, on your first graphs, Moritz, uh, it's highly dependent on the definition of debt you use. Uh, if I take the case of France, which was often quoted, if you take consolidated data with economic groups and not only individual data, the picture is quite different. And if you take net debt uh, and not only gross debt, the picture is completely different for the last two years. In our case, gross debt increased significantly, indeed. But as cash holdings increase in the same proportion, net debt remains stable. Uh, second, uh, my strong interest is for your caveat number one. And, and I think you have something highly interesting there to say that uh, debt in tradable sector does not matter that much. Trade in non-tradable linked to households probably matters to, to diminish the, the GDP potential. And uh, the housing sector and mortgages is a very interesting test for your hypothesis. So we should dig upon that. And my question to conclude with, uh, I would tend to agree with your idea that evolution with the caveats is not that important, but the absolute level of corporate debt to GDP matters, and still more its opposite, so to say, or its complementary, which is the absolute level of equity to GDP. And here, clearly, a firm which is financed through equity will be more risk-friendly and more ready to innovate. And this is not only at micro level, we see it, unfortunately for us Europeans, at macro level, uh, corporate equity to GDP is twice higher, at least twice higher in the US and in Europe, and the capacity to innovate is obviously stronger. So I would like you to elaborate on that. Thank you, Francois. Uh, Maurice, you want to address this question? Yes, thank you very much, Governor. Um, I'll, I'll, your point on the data is well taken, and um, I also think that um, maybe I can uh, blend in uh, what what Egon uh, in his discussion also uh, mentioned. Thank you, by the way, Egon, for the great discussion. Is that um, the absolute level of debt and the question of tail risk. So these are two things that we uh, looked at, or that I looked at for the paper. Uh, it turns out that the tail risk dimension, if you look at quantile um, regressions, is also not elevated in uh, after corporate debt booms. So corporate debt booms don't make the bad recessions even worse. Um, and the level of debt, um, so controlling for corporate debt to GDP levels at the onset of the um, of the recession, uh, just very little, it, it matters a tiny little bit, but it doesn't change the overall picture dramatically. But this being said, these two, with these two um, little clarifications, I think uh, your point is very, is very um, important and very well taken that um, the gross debt um, pers perspective that we take in this uh, in this research um, is um, you know, in, in an ideal world we could complement this by having the complete view of the balance sheet structure of these companies and even look at um, the distribution ideally of uh, financial vulnerabilities and balance sheets across the firm across the firm distribution I think that's very important research that has advanced in recent years uh, we know for example that some companies in the tax sectors are very cash rich and, and look very healthy, whereas others um, have increased uh, leverage uh, quite a lot. Um, last point, maybe also on, on, on Egon's uh, point about sentiment. I'm absolutely, um, I, I think this is uh, complementary in a very important way. Um, um, I'm, I'm a great fan of that line of research as well. And it is true that in, in recent years, um, you know, many indicators of credit market sentiment before COVID have flashed red in terms of covenant light loans, in terms of um, spreads, in terms of um, 
um, a, a, the leveraged loan business. Um, so I guess the this big picture view that I present here, as you said, always has to be. This time could be different, um, but I think I think it's important to just say like yeah. And then we we it would be the exception from the rule. The rule is more that um, corporate debt booms are certainly not as um, drawn out and not as harmful as. Um, as household debt booms uh, tend to be. Maybe I'll leave it here to leave time for more questions. Thank you, Moritz. The next uh, quick question for a quick answer is from Professor Kalemli Oskar from the University of Maryland. Thank you very much. Excellent paper and excellent discussion. Uh, I'm going to make three remarks. First one is on COVID. And as at the introduction uh, pointed out, the heterogeneity is very important. And if you want to do something uh, that makes sure of that is the COVID shock. So uh, Pierre-Olivier Vegoncha, Nick Sander, and Veronica Penchovaka, we did several papers, one including in the Jackson Hole Symposium of this year, uh, very similar to the French paper that Igor mentioned, but we did 27 countries, sectors, and firms, balance sheets. And what we find is actually uh, under COVID, because of a tremendous policy action, neither corporate debt or rank nor zombification are issues. But this doesn't mean these weren't issues historically. So this brings me to my second comment and Morris' main conclusion, that this was an issue historically. My paper on corporate debt overhang in Europe with Luke Levin find a very serious impact on sluggish recovery and low investment and output of corporate debt for the 2008-2010 crisis in Europe, which was, of course, a financial crisis. Uh, so I would like to get uh, Morris' views on that. I mean, basically coming to my last comment that the importance of bank-based systems, financial frictions, and the fact that small firms are extremely important. Many of the papers mentioned, like Benerj and Hoffman, only use listed firm data. These firms are not really financial constraint firms, and you know they, are, they have debt, but they have other sorts of financing too. When we think about SMEs, which constitutes a large part of corporate debt in Europe, and also in US in terms of bank loans, and also more than 30% of employment and more than 50% of aggregate output. As policymakers, we should be very concerned about both loans and bonds of SMEs and need to think about ways how once we bring them into the picture, are we still going to get the view that you know these things don't matter for aggregate outcomes? Thank you. Uh, Maurice, you have the floor. I would kind of ask to have uh, quicker questions and quicker answers. Thank you. I'll be quick my answer. Hi, Shabnam. Thanks so much for the comments. Um, they are very well taken. I know you, I mean, your work with, with Luke and, and others was very important. And I, I think it's it's fair to say there is a certain tension between the micro and the macro evidence. And um, and, and I'm a great fan of these micro studies. And I think on, on, a, on the firm level, these effects are measurable. Um, and there's a certain tension that apparently at least from this very like bird's eye, um, um, high flying altitude perspective that I have in this paper, these micro effects do not translate into measurable macro effects. That could have all kinds of reasons. There could be general equilibrium effects. Yes, there are zombies, but then other companies come in and invest more and take up their business. Prices can adjust. I think. I, I guess we're not going to solve this today, but I think it's important for policymakers to be aware that the micro evidence, yes, I would absolutely agree there is from your work and other work, there's evidence that on the micro level debt overhang on the company level is a thing. Um, and inhibits investment and, and, and firm growth. On the other hand, there is a gap between the micro and the sort of the macro and um, we're not quite sure uh, why these micro effects do not generate larger uh, macro effects. On the second point, bank-based systems, I agree, small firms, heterogeneity, all these things matter a great deal. And I think all of those would probably argue that um, it's important for Europe and the European um, um, supervisors and, and policymakers to keep a close look at the small firm situation, at the situation at banks. Um, I, I, as I mentioned in my in my talk as well, I think that's the main of these three caveats, uh, likely the main risk uh, right now for, for the outlook. Thank you. Thank you, Moritz. Next question is from Professor Hemke from the London School of Economics. Professor Emke, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I had trouble unmuting myself. Sorry. My um, my comment follows up, um, I think, on what was just discussed also um, uh, after Shannon's comment. 
You know, in the work that at the um, ESRB ASC we did on bankruptcy, I think one of the worries that came out of um, our studies was that if a large proportion of this falls onto small or very small firms, then, and this, you know, links back to the previous paper we saw, then perhaps the at least the formal but perhaps also the informal bankruptcy and insolvency procedures that we have may not work as efficiently there. And so um, I wonder whether uh, caveat, I think it was caveat two in Moritz's paper, is something that deserves particular attention this time around. I'd be interested in, uh, in your views on that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Moritz? I, uh, I'll endorse that. I think that's it's an important point, um, and it comes back to sort of let's we need to try to get the micro and the macro together. I think in the current context, and we have it from Victoria's excellent paper earlier. Um, insolvency and debt reorganization regimes are crucial. They are, I think, understudied in the literature, um, and but they matter a great deal. As is the question of asset-based versus cash flow-based lending in the corporate space, where I think. Uh, we don't have very good uh, cross-country data. There's a recent, uh, a very nice paper for the US, but for other countries, we don't know that. And to the extent that we get these feedback cycles between declining asset prices, hope for recovery, um, you know, evergreening loans, you could, you know, you could have the suspicion that this is much more prominent in asset-based lending um, situations where you know you, you you wait for recovery. So there's a lot to be done, but um, there's no Martin's points are, are very very uh, well taken. Thank you. Next question is from Professor Sizova from the Catholic University of Louvain. We we don't hear you. You may be muted. Now, do you hear me now? Yes. Yeah, great. Uh, just a small correction. I'm not uh, a professor at Kiev Leuven, but I'm a PhD student, so I'm one of the not participants yet. of the Young Economist Competition. I have a small question about the uh, caveat three of uh, Professor Schlarik's uh, presentation, and in particular the zombie lending. So um, in that respect, it's maybe also related to the first presentation of Professor uh, Ivashina. So my question is about um, uh, whether we should see zombie lending as only a negative uh, thing for, for the economy, in a sense that I know there is a recent evidence using European data that actually zombie lending can have a disinflationary uh, effect in a sense that it, uh, due to this uh, extension of credit to additional firms, we actually create excess uh, productivity uh, capacity and this pushes the prices down. So I just would like to hear your opinion on this potential effect and whether maybe policymakers in Europe could actually use zombie lending, which is, seems to be present in Europe, to decrease the inflation. Thank you. Maurice? Uh, I think that's maybe the last part is more question for policymakers for you, Fabio. But um, I think the idea with the zombie lending is um, is that it inhibits restructuring and and the efficient allocation of capital, uh, and thereby slows down productivity growth. I think there is evidence for that, uh, and that's why we're mainly worried about it. Um, but at the same time, I think um, if I can make this point again that I made at the end of my presentation. Um, it, these phenomena to the degree that they're often linked to accommodative monetary policy or low interest rate environments, uh, I think they miss an important point and that's come out of recent research by so to my former colleague and a, and a student from Bonn that the, the aggregate demand conditions are extremely important for uh, business formation and the success of startups. So this, the, this opposition that's often created between uh, low interest rates uh, in inhibit business dynamism, firm creation and creative destruction has, has it all wrong. It has the science wrong in the sense that uh, you need a, a good aggregate demand environment to uh, help startups uh, thrive and thereby uh, lead to the very creative destruction and productivity growth that we all want to see. Thank you. We now have the last question from Francesco Ninfo Ninfole from the newspaper Milano Finanza. Francesco, you have the floor. Thank you. Good afternoon. My question is about caveat number three, um, because in your research you have uh, underlined the importance also uh, of uh, precautionary capitalization 
along with the stringent supervision. Uh, based on this conclusion, would you suggest an uh, enhanced role for precautionary recapitalization and maybe a more flexible framework than the one we have seen in Europe? Thank you. Moritz? Yeah, thank you very much for the question. It is important, and I discussed it in my paper um, in, in, in greater length than I could in the presentation. Um, I think the evidence is, is quite um, clear that weakly capitalized or weakly supervised banking systems see more evergreening of bad loans, see more zombie creation. Um, um, Victoria added another important um, dimension, which is, again, there is also the role of bankruptcy and insolvency regimes that can also contribute, and that then prevents the exit of impaired businesses and, and, and depresses productivity growth. Um, I think... Um, I think we owe ourselves as Europeans a very close second look at the situation this time around because I think uh, after the global financial crisis, the cleanup of uh, bank balance sheets uh, was not optimal, was not fast enough. And again, the, the worst, uh, I think the worst policy, and that's true also from my research that I presented today in, in terms of the aftermath of corporate credit booms, the worst possible policy is a policy of kicking the can down the road. Um, to the extent that precautionary recapitalizations um, are a way to deal with this, the politi political economy of those is very difficult, of, obviously, um, and credible stress tests um, are, are, are the important and best tools to deal with this. But I can, I can just, I agree with you that um, we have... Um, you know, we have some homework to do, uh, I think, on this front. Thank you, Moritz. So we have no more questions. And as we come uh, to the end of this panel, let me share with you my personal takeaways. In the coming months, uh, it is uh, paramount that we prevent with our policy actions the emergence of an adverse uh, feedback loop between insolvencies, financial conditions and the real economy. The problem, of course, is how to do this. I believe that the paper suggests two policy conclusions. The first one is for the European Central Bank. The best way for monetary policy to prevent adverse feedback loops in the recovery phase is to effectively support aggregate demand, avoiding premature actions that could drive up bankruptcies and start a vicious feedback loop. Uh, in other words, uh, the benign results of the paper are conditional on policy. The second conclusion is for other policymakers. Enhancing corporate insolvency frameworks across the European Union is crucial. I thus hope that we could move fast on the initiatives on this front foreseen by the Action Plan for a Capital Market Union presented by the European Commission in 2020. On this note, let me thank once again Moritz, Egon and all participants who intervened for this very rich discussion. Over to you, Claire. Thank you, Mr. Panetta, for those very insightful closing remarks and the excellent chairing of the discussion today. Thank you to Moritz and Egon, too, who, despite the chair's spoiler, managed to, I think, provide much additional detail, which I think is going to be of interest to our participants. I'd also like to thank the participants, too, for asking so many insightful questions in both this and the previous session. We are going to now take another break. We're going to be back again at five Central European time to try and unpick one of the big topics of the day, which is the future of inflation. Join us again then. Thanks a lot. Bye.